everyone to the seminar. As you already know, please, before starting, uh, change your mobile phones to silent mode so we can have your full attention and our interruptions. This session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English. And finally, don't forget to complete the electronic evaluation for this session. You can find the QR code on your tag. And now we're ready to start. Uh, this current session is under the track of student track. The title of the presentation is A Study of Alumni Copper Batteries and is our speaker, Kevin Patina from the University of Houston, Delta. Hello, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, one of my research uh, projects, uh, the study of aluminum copper batteries. But I'm also going to be presenting a bunch of other uh, batteries of different uh, forms. Uh, but all of them under the umbrella of renewable and uh, portable batteries based on recyclable and household materials. Uh, since our project is based on green energy and recyclable materials, uh, we focused on these 12 principles of uh, green chemistry, which is to prevent waste. We didn't, we didn't want to create more waste with our products or with our uh, inventions because we're uh, trying to uh, alleviate some of those issues. And uh, we wanted to also, at the same time, create, uh, mitigate pollution. So we want uh, safe chemical designs within our, within our um, uh, research. We, wanted, uh, we, didn't, we don't want a hazardous synthesis. So when these different materials interact with the environment, we don't want them to uh, mix or react with each other that could cause harmful events, even if the materials that we used weren't harmful themselves. Uh, we want to use renewable uh, food feedstocks which basically means that we want materials that are easily accessible, uh, that don't need a, such grand amounts of production, because even with uh, pretty safe or renewable materials, sometimes they have uh, the production of them can be very complex and could end up creating pollution through uh, the factory uh, process. Uh, we want to use catalysts, not uh, stoichiometric uh, reagents. Uh, basically, we want uh, nothing that's too artificially um, generated so we want natural materials we want something that, that we can find in the environment without having to uh, produce them in a lab because we want to use household materials recyclable materials things that have already been created things that already, already can be found uh, we want to avoid uh, chemical derivatives this is um, uh, following up again we want something that's natural something that we can find something that's not too complex we don't have to go out of our way to produce more chemicals produce more things such as that and we want to maximize the atom economy basically uh, mitigate the amount of uh, waste uh, uh, at the atomic level, which sounds really complex, but it's just uh, we want to be efficient. We don't want to use um, an extraneous amount of materials for something that does, doesn't need it. Uh, we want to use safer solvents and reaction conditions. We want to make the uh, production of these materials, of these uh, different batteries, to be safe and to um, not require super hyper specific conditions because then if we have a like laboratory environment where we need these hyper specific conditions for this one battery to work that's just very inefficient and not very very much worth the effort <coughs> we want to increase energy efficiency so we want to create these batteries and the batteries that we created are not the greatest because we want to use uh, very common materials we didn't go out of our way to like um, a specific manufacturer to find them we had to uh, use what we had on hand within our homes or within our laboratory, within our uh, city. Uh, so we wanted to uh, use these materials and create a, a battery that functions and then develop on them so that they could become more and more efficient. Uh, we want to design chemicals uh, to degrade after use. So what this means is that we want chemicals to be used, we want materials to be used, and to not remain in the environment. Because there's a lot of things like plastics and stuff that can remain in the water and in the ground for uh, thousands and thousands of years that end up doing a lot of harm. There's a lot of harm with microplastics especially, but within the ocean uh, going on. So we want to prevent that. Uh, analyze in real time to prevent pollution. We want to constantly be vigilant about what kind of materials we're using, what kind of uh, production methods we have so that we don't produce any pollution, because the whole point is that we're trying to use green energy to uh, mitigate the pollution. And uh, minimize the potential for actions. We want to make sure that this um, is efficient, it's safe, it doesn't cause pollution, but we also want to make sure that the production of it actually doesn't have that much risk for, for uh, danger. 
because there's like some chemicals that it can produce that can end up in explosions or can end up with poisonous and toxic gas and we want to make sure that we don't uh, pose that risk because what would be the point of creating such an efficient uh, green energy type of battery if the production of it could lead to a massive explosion or massive disaster that could pollute the environment even worse. So the outline for our general project is to use recycled materials, household materials, um, anything that we could pretty much find and packages it, package it into a small portable battery solution that's alternative to standard uh, lithium batteries and such that are much more uh, costly to produce, especially because the materials are very rare. Um, so we have a uh, handful of different batteries that we're going to go over. Uh, but they're all focused on green energy, so uh, no waste, recyclable materials. Um, uh, very efficient uh, for, for the quality of the materials that we have. And uh, that can be applied in the field. So we have a bunch of different field applications and such for, for these batteries. And the first one we're going to go over is uh, microbial fuel cell uh, based batteries. Uh, MFC is what I'm going to call them for short. Uh, in, in essence, they're batteries that comprise of two parts. One part, which is a, a cathode chamber, which is aerobic, which means it just uh, contains oxygen. And a second chamber, which can be an anaerobic, which means it will not contain oxygen. And in that uh, anaerobic chamber, which is our cathode, we're going to have uh, anaerobic uh, bacteria. And these bacteria uh, will, uh, within their uh, metabolic processes, when they uh, consume food and create waste and such, they create a, a, a cycle of uh, a redox reaction, which is the way, which is typically how batteries work. So we've been able to uh, produce this, um, this battery which uses the um, re redox reaction of the bacteria's uh, metabolic processes to create a simulation of like what a battery would do, uh, uh, taking electrons from a, a uh, anode chamber into the cathode chamber. Uh, and we have a, um, a couple graphs here. Uh, we had three batteries, three battery cells, which are put together in two different formations, a series and a parallel. Uh, we tested both of these uh, alongside different uh, sugars or the, the food that we used for the, um, the bacteria. We had uh, fructose, salt water, we had uh, distilled water, and we had a control, um, which is just like standard water that we, that we had uh, from the environment. And we put them together and we measured the different uh, outputs that they were able to produce. This is what those looked like. They were just, um, there was three sets, each of them connected by a, a tube, and we put a lot of tape on them to make sure nothing gets in or out. And um, we had all of these put together in this big stand to separate them from anything outside, make sure nothing can interact with them, and uh, set them up so that we could uh, unplug and plug in those wires and create these, uh, the, the series and the parallel uh, simultaneously without having to, to rebuild or create multiple of these because we have very limited materials. Uh, our second battery here is a uh, earth and soil cell based battery. These are very interesting because they sort of function like solar panels in a way, but they're just dirt. Dirt that we found in the environment and we put uh, as like a prototype within a um, ice cube sheet. Uh, as you can see, which is very interesting, the, the, the soil after left out in the sun for a while is producing some amount of electricity. And we use uh, this as, a, as more of a frame of reference as an example uh, for uh, more solar batteries, uh, which we use very old um, CDs because they are constructed to function with like light to be able to, to, to read light within a CD player. So we, we figured that they'll be able to, to absorb light in a way that that's, doesn't require a massive, expensive um, solar panel. And they were actually functioned pretty well. They, did, they were able to produce uh, electricity after being out in the sun. Uh, the next thing we have here is natural dye and its application in pH value, semi-quantitative and titration measurement. Uh, Sounds complicated, but it's basically we used a very specific type of chemical to be able to uh, uh, measure the electric processes that happen in batteries, the redox reaction. Um, and we did that by using the specific chemical found in different types of vegetables. One of the main ones is red cabbage. So we were able to boil the, the red cabbage and extract it through a, a titration process. 
and be able to get the specific chemical. An anthosanin, uh, an anthosanin molecule, which we've been able to uh, place within the, these different battery cells in order to measure how these electric processes uh, work to see if these batteries actually function. Uh, you can see here we have a homemade barrette, homemade uh, different like filtration uh, system. So instead of using a professionally made uh, titration or barrette, we did it homemade to, to prove that it's not a very complicated process. We don't need that much uh, materials to actually produce it. Uh, these are the different outcomes that we were able to come up with, the different pH values of those separate outcomes, the A, B, and C outcomes, and the reactions that we were able to uh, measure here with these dyes allowed us to um, prove that these batteries were able to function and produce some sort of amount of electricity. Uh, this is a, a visual of these um, different batteries functioning. You see the bubbles as they, the electricity is being produced. The, now we're going to go in depth on a specific case study. This case study is the one that I personally worked on. It is the aluminum-based batteries. Um, so these batteries function very similarly to pretty much all batteries. It's based on a redox reaction, but I wanted to specifically create a redox reaction between two different metals like, like, um, that are very common. So we have copper and aluminum. These two are extremely common. We use them in wires, with aluminum foil, they're everywhere. So we wanted to figure, oh, uh, there's a ton of stuff like aluminum foil and stuff that people use and then discard and then well, they, they, we don't know what happens to them. They probably get recycled, but they're not, um, they're, they sometimes go into waste. They're, they're, they're not always recycled. So we figured we could probably use some of that uh, material to make a semi-functional battery. Um, we have a small uh, test here that we did before we constructed a, a physical battery to um, measure how this, this type of um, battery would functionally work. So we have a bunch of different um, uh, solutions of salt and water, just some basic sodium chloride, and the aluminum and the copper uh, anodes and cathodes uh, placed into separate baths and connected with wires, and we were able to produce uh, some light. That's a, uh, a LED light right there, it's orange. So in essence, we wanted to take that larger battery system and compress it down into a single like, bo like box, essentially, uh, by leaving some space for air to pass through and allowing the, the different electro electrons to pass between these different uh, anodes and cathodes and across the entirety of the battery with multiple cells, not just a single uh, stick of aluminum and copper. And we wanted to uh, um, outweigh the pros and cons of this type of battery. And although we realize that this battery will not be the strongest battery in the world, we do know that this will be extremely lightweight, extremely portable, and extremely helpful uh, in terms of uh, getting rid of some uh, pollution and waste from the environment. Uh, the aluminum uh, copper batteries uh, function off of the redox reaction, like I said, and uh, the batteries have a, uh, we, as we measured, would have a high energy density of 8.1 kilowatt uh, per kilogram. So the goal, again, would be to create uh, the cheapest battery possible with recyclable materials, very lightweight, very efficient, and uh, here we have some of the materials they use. This is now the process of when we were making the functional battery. We used um, cardboard stock and we placed a aluminum sheet above on top of them and we used electri uh, electricity tape so that no electricity would escape from it so it all be contained to the battery. And we would just have these two different sheets, the anode and the cathode, a, um, just a flat aluminum sheet and the uh, cathode was a lot more specific. We, wanted, we didn't want to use too much copper because we know that there's going to be fun a lot more uh, functional aluminum uh, as waste rather than copper. So we used a very thin sheet of uh, copper mesh, which uh, is has a lot less copper than just like a, a copper foil or something, just to accurately represent how much copper we're going to have. But in order to make sure that all of the electricity passed through, we created a, a paste to put on top of that cathode uh, strip, which was made of just some uh, acrylic paint and graphite powder, and we, were, we wanted the electricity to pass through the graphite and into the, the copper strip and continue through the, the cycle of the, the battery and the different cells. 
And again, our solution that we used, our electrolyte for the, the battery, was just salt water, just uh, sodium chloride. And in the end, we created two batteries. Uh, battery A, which is the one on the left, which is a larger battery. It's about 13.5 by 9.5 centimeters. It is a 10-cell battery, and uh, both, these cells are, both these batteries are 10-cell batteries. So they're comprised of 10 components of an of a anode cathode pair. The smaller battery is approximately 9 by 7 centimeters. So it's, pro so it's about half as wide, but it is yeah, equally as long. Uh, we wanted to test these batteries with LEDs because we figured that such a small battery that didn't really have a lot of power behind it would be able to, to function as like a, a light source because LED lights don't use a lot of electricity. So we use it as a very simple replacement for a lot of like light stuff in like small devices. So uh, within our tests, we were able to get a uh, battery A, which is a larger battery, to dimly light uh, the yellow LED, which was something that we noticed, uh, despite every other LED functioning perfectly fine. And battery B was able to also light up every single uh, LED light of every single color, but battery B was able to light them up brighter. What I'm going to show you here, these, two, these are the, the different pictures that we took for the, the two tests. Uh, as you can see, battery B ends up having brighter lights even between the same colors. Uh, especially with red, which we can see the very bottom left uh, image on battery A is the red light and the, the top left image on battery B is the red light. They're, that's the biggest example that I can give for how different these batteries were and how bright they were able to produce these lights. Uh, next we measured the different uh, voltage and, amp and uh, amplitude for these different batteries and what we noticed is that both of them started at 5 volts. And over the course of 24 hours, this slowly started to degrade over time, uh, ending up with a battery A having 3.96 and battery B having 2.94 volts. Uh, in the current, the amplitude, uh, we have a very big difference between both battery A and B. Battery B started up at a very high 7.2, but ended up degrading very quickly over the 24 hours to a 4.2. The battery um, A started at a very low 0 0.33 and degraded very little um, until it reached, after 24 hours, 0 0.23. Uh, what we concluded about these two batteries, uh, especially based on the, the physical test of the LEDs and the, the numerical measurements that we found, is that both, well, both battery A and B had uh, 5 um, volts. Um, battery uh, B degraded very quickly in both uh, respects, both voltage and in uh, and current. So we believe that the smaller size of battery B allows it to produce more current and functionally uh, apply more electricity to the, the things that it's connected to. That's why the lights were brighter than uh, any than the any of the ones from battery A. But because there's so much, they're uh, pushing out more electricity than battery A. They degrade a lot faster. Uh, here's some references for some of the research that I did for this project and a um, acknowledgement of a lot of the people that helped me on this assignment, especially um, Scholars Academy, uh, University of Houston Downtown, and my uh, faculty mentor, Dr. Jane. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> my name is Catherine Escanante. I'm here with Eastern Connecticut State University. And I just think the concept of green chemistry is really, really interesting, um, especially in relation to like sustainability and like you were mentioning like ocean and microplastics. I just wanted um, to kind of hear about your motivation and kind of going into, you know, kind of such a niche like green chemistry and conducting this study in the first place. Right. So I think that, um Global warming is probably one of the biggest crises that we're facing as like the entirety of the human race. Of course, there's a lot of problems in the world, I know that, but I feel like the most imminent danger that we face is uh, global warming. And I feel that we need to put our, our best foot forward to mitigate some of those uh, effects that climate change could bring by becoming a lot more green as like a, uh, with a lot of our products and such. And I know that 
Some of those things won't happen unless we can create products to replace the previous ones that are a lot more efficient or a lot more helpful in very niche or specific environments to at least sort of cushion the blow of, of how fast we're leading down that path. Thank you. Any other question? So I want I wanted to ask, was, what was your biggest challenge during this process and how you overcome it? Um, the biggest problem was that we didn't have any any materials because we the whole pro the whole point of the process was to go out and find the materials, mm -hmm. not just purchase them. So that was uh, that was a little bit uh, troubling, especially since we uh, with a lot of materials that we did have, you had to simulate how it would be like it for to get the recycled materials. Mm -hmm. um, so, like for example, copper uh, for my battery specifically, uh, I could not find any copper related thing that would help me in my situation. So uh, I had to uh, resort to actually getting some copper from someone else, and they only had copper meshes, and I had to take that into consideration when creating my battery and uh, the environment for the, um, the recyclable materials. Thank you. So if there's no any other question, uh, uh, remember that you can go here in your car and go to first day, and fill out the form and also since the, this is like the last seminar of today, you can go to general evaluation and fill out the form too. So thank you everyone for your questions and being present in this session and thank you for the presentation.